I'm honored now to be joined by my next guest for a very, very special panel discussion. I'll get into why in a moment. General Charles Q. Brown Jr. is the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He made history last summer when he became the first black person to lead a branch of the U.S. military. And General James C. McConville is the Chief of Staff of the Army. General ba Brown, General McConville, welcome. Uh, one of the reasons I think is very special, and I you know, apologize to the Army, I grew up as an Air Force brat. So I grew up on military bases all over the world where there was usually an Army base not too far away. Uh, uh, and so when you go back like three or four decades, that used to you know, be a lot of ball games, a lot of you know, fun, fun tension. So it's a great honor to have you both um, here today. You know, as, you know, I've talked with Secretary Hagel, uh, Avril Haines, the Director of National Intelligence, as you heard just now, uh, Michelle Flournoy, about what do we need to do to remove certain bland, blind spots so that we're fighting tomorrow's challenges and not yesterday's. Um, and I would just love to, to start you know, with something we just talked about, which is, uh, it's a mouthful, um, the joint, uh, the, the joint all domain command and control connect everything project, which I know you're both working on, working on, but basically talk about what are the blind spots projects like this are removing. General McConville? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, thanks, thanks for having me. And it's great to be here with uh, my teammate, uh, General CQ Brown. And, and I think what we're, we're trying to do with a joint all demand command and control um, approach is, is recognizing, you know, everything we do in the future, we're going to fight joint. And quite frankly, we've added a C to that because uh, we, we think we're going to fight combined in, in recognizing the importance of our allies and partners. And as we see the, the future battlefield, you know, s speed is going to be important, range is going to be important, and then most important is the convergence. And I think what JAD C2 or C JAD C2 allows us to do, it allows us to use all the sensors on the battlefield and then get them using the technology. Uh, to the to the right shooter, if you will, using artificial intelligence and taking advantage of the whole joint force. So I think it fundamentally changes the way we operate. It gives us decision dominance, which gives us overmatch. Gen General Bound, I'd love to get your response in this as well. But as you're sharing your thoughts, um, I just want to add that you know, decades ago, when I was talking to the net assessment head in the Pentagon. He said, you know, what the Chinese are writing about us is that we're about to get engaged in a revolution in military affairs before the Gulf, first Gulf War. We're going to attach intelligence to soldiers and battlefield decisions and, and that the Chinese thought they needed to ramp up to do that. And I guess what I've just heard from General McConville, what I think this is about is a massive like, you know, revolution in military affairs, you know, 9.0. Am I right in that is, or, or do I have some misconception? No, Steve, first of all, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to be here with you and then be here with uh, Jim McConville as well. And, you know, wh what I look at is it, it is a revolution in uh, military affairs. And it's not just from a, a technical standpoint, but it's a mindset as well. And the aspect of it, it is being able to bring all the information and data that we have together to allow um, quicker decisions, to be able to have that range, speed and agility and to be responsive. And you know, for the United States Air Force to be able to strike uh, any target anywhere on the globe and do it uh, in, in a very timely manner. But it's really how do we bring all this information together at, at the key levels to make decisions. And that may be all the way at a more strategic level where Jim and I sit and uh, our, some of our, our peers do, but also down at the lower tactical level where we have our airmen and, uh, and soldiers at a lower level that can actually make decisions based on the data we have. Because it's going to be, it's going to be whatever we see in the future is going to be very fast paced, and I think about you know just our day to day lives today and all the information we have at our fingertips. Uh, that's what we want to make sure we have that's relevant for our war fighters to make those decisions and to take action um, based on uh, commander's intent. I want to ask you both: Are we vulnerable on the cyber front of this? You know, when we read about Chinese penetration of, you know, the Department of Homeland Security or Russian penetration of election systems or, you know, concerns about our electric grid um, and what Michelle Fornoy just shared as what she believes is one of, you know, China's um, strategic goals, which is basically to shut us down before, you know, battles start, you know, from decision making and cyber. Um, I guess the natural question is how vulnerable are we and what you're planning to do on the cyber front? Well, I think, at least from the Army standpoint, I think we got to recognize that we're going to be contested in all domains, and cyber is one of them. Air is another domain. Mm -hmm. uh, space is another domain. We're going to be contested uh, in the sea, and we're going to be tested in the land. So all of us need to be aware of that. 
and we build systems. I think the discussion moves, and we often talk about kill chains. We're talking about kill webs now because we've got to have very, re very resilient systems in place. And, and we should assume that the technology we're using, uh, our adversaries are going to try to impact that to take away the advantage we get by bringing uh, the joint forces together, by bringing the combined forces together. So that that is what is going on right now in, in all the services is how do we make sure we have very resilient connections between all of us. All right, General Brown. Yeah, I would I would echo what Jim said, but I would also tell you what I feel right now. We are already in contested space when you think about cyber, and you just you mentioned uh, or you think about solar winds and some of the other aspects that we see sure. um, across the really across our nation. And we got to pay attention to it, not just from a military standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint, from an information standpoint. And, and this is something we always got to take one step ahead of our, our, of our adversary. And this is where it takes collaboration between the services, but also those in the tech sector that uh, that do this for a living. And, and really, how do we actually ensure that we as a nation and with our allies and partners uh, can maintain a level of cybersecurity and, and stay one step ahead of our adversary? I would love you both, if you don't mind, to do something. I hadn't planned. I didn't tell your people I was going to ask you this, but I think along the lines of how your services have evolved. As I mentioned earlier, I had the commandant of the Marine Corps on, on the other day. We were talking about various amphibious platforms that are out there, both that did humanitarian things, but also were war fighting, projected power. But there, you know, some concern about uh, the number of ships and vessels. But I know that you know, a lot of people think you know, Army deployed uh, military human units, Air Force rockets, planes. I mean, tell us how both of your services are so far beyond those. And now we have space. You have the Navy, the Marines, other elements of power. Um, and you mentioned collaboration between the services. I'd just love to get, give our audience, a lay audience, an understanding that, that you know, you've grown in very different directions than perhaps my own antiquated nature of how I frame the Army. General? Well, I mean, you know, the Army is, is, is people will, will stand by people, but they're really people enabled by technology. Hmm. And, you know, it, where we used to talk about industrial age mass of armies, uh, now it's much more sophisticated. We want to take advantage uh, of and work closely with our joint partners because they bring incredible uh, capabilities uh, to the fight. And some places that these, the other service will be the lead and will be in support. Sometimes we'll be in the lead and they'll be in support. Sometimes we'll all be in this together. But what I see the difference is, is the uh the, the the speed and range that we're going to have to operate on and, and mm. really how we take technology to bring lethal effects in a much faster uh manner we just did project convergence uh, out in yuma and and what we took away from that was taking advantage of the technology taking advantage of the machine to machine interchange using artificial intelligence we we're getting lethal effects in tens of seconds vice ten of, tens of minutes and as CQ said, speed really matters on the battlefield, and we're all attempting to achieve that. John Brown? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what I would add to that, I mean, you know, the big change for the Air Force is we really think more about um, not only the, the technology or the platforms that we have a chance to operate, but it's also the um, really the information that goes with it that drives our decision making. And uh, whether it's a kill chain to actually strike something kinetically, or it's uh, information that gives us the decision advantage. And it's really thinking differently about how we approach things. And it's really how we empower airmen to make those decisions at the lower level. I really believe in, we need to delegate down to the lowest capable and competent level. But we got to, as senior leaders, we got to ensure they have the tools to be able to do and execute what we expect them to do, what our nation expects us to do, to be able to hold targets at risk, but also maintain our level of national security. And, and that is where you know, the services have to work together because we, we all have a different perspective at how we look at uh, the battlefield or a strategic environment. And, and it's the beauty of how all those come together that will make us successful um, because of our very, very perspectives and very capabilities that uh, we, we all share and bring together as a joint team. Yeah, Let me if I could add one, one yeah, thing that I, I just want to mention, which is I talked about people being, you know, you know, in the Army so important. But the, the other thing I think we and a lot of the other services are looking at is unmanned capability, autonomous capability. We always want a person in the loop, but that person doesn't necessarily need to be in the lead vehicle, the lead aircraft, and using technology to solve some of the more difficult problem sets uh, is something that we're all looking at. So, you know, we, we look on the ground with unmanned, man-unmanned teaming. We even see some unmanned, unmanned teaming 
uh, to take advantage of the technology and, and quite frankly, protect our soldiers during the battles. Let me, let me ask you folks an out of left field question perhaps, but I'm interested in this because I grew up in the military and you know, culture has been an evolving uh, challenge. We've had a lot of debate recently about women uh, serving in the military in certain roles. We've had a lot of transgendered service, had a, you know, discussion about you know, sexual violence. We all have discussion about January 6th and some of the people that participated that had joined various groups that were military veterans. And Secretary Austin you know, created a day, I guess, of introspection to begin, to begin looking at these. My question is from a war fighting capacity and readiness, are we in good shape, number one, and number two, are we making progress on some of these social and cultural issues that seem to be percolating and have been percolating not just now, but you know, over several administrations? I, at least from the Army standpoint, is the secret sauce of the, the Army is unit cohesion. Mm. Uh, that's what is, brings units together in combat. That's what makes them uh, very successful. So we have harmful behaviors like sexual harassment, sexual assault, racism and extremism in our force that breaks down unit cohesion. And, and, and it's just quite frankly, not something we want uh, in the army. It breaks the trust in the army. It hurts our soldiers. And so we, we can't have those type of things uh, in, in our army. And I, I, we're going after that very aggressively. Uh, we don't see a lot of that in the army, but at the same time, one is too many when it comes to those humble behaviors. So we are committed uh, to making sure we don't have them. Thank you, General Brown. Yeah, so I guess what I would add to, to, to Jim uh, Combo's comments is uh, I, I often think about what's, what is good about our United States Air Force, our United States military, and, and all the things that our, our uh, service members do when they uh, take an oath of uh, office or oath of enlistment in the environment where we want to, all of our service members to reach their full potential. But then you have uh, you know, some of the examples that Jim described where there, it, whether it's racism, discrimination, sexual assault, harassment, interpersonal violence, extremism that detract from you know what makes our military so strong and uh from a readiness standpoint you know i i think we, we're doing okay there's things we can always do better on um but it, the fact that we're actually having these conversations and i, I think our, our service members appreciate the fact that we're having these conversations to make progress the united states military in our nation has really led the way in certain, certain areas and I, I think about the privilege for me to be in the position i am as the first african-american to serve as a service chief um, and I just, matter of fact, this weekend spoke to uh, uh, a, a Tuskegee Airmen event where um, because of them, I'm actually able to do what I, what I do today. And so uh, I really value the, the service from those that went before us and uh, those of us, uh, myself and Jim and the rest of the service chiefs and what we're doing to ensure that all our service members can reach their full potential. Just as we close up, I really appreciate your candor, and because I, I know these are a uh, tough issue to talk about. But just as we close up, because I am, I wanted to learn more from your team about the connect everything. I've always been interested in technology and how it changes uh, what your options are out there. Let me let me just final line, you know, leave you with one final um, unfair question, which is, you know, what are you what do you think is a blind spot that we ought to be thinking more about? Uh, we, you know, as I told Michelle Fornoy. You know, it's not surprising we're talking about China or Russia or North Korea or Iran. You know, that would have been the case anyway. Maybe, maybe different talking about the way in which those threats are deployed or the battle forms. But I'm just sort of interested in whether or not you have exercises that tries to think about, aha, we hadn't thought about, I don't know, domestic security. We hadn't thought about, you know, terror groups before 9-11 occurred. Are, are, there, are there things out there, not to kind of give a green flag to anyone this thing, but, but are, are there ways or exercises, you know, mental processes that you go through and exercises to help us see beyond the corner um, so that we're not just doing what we did yesterday and feeling good that we're doing the same thing today? Uh, General McConnell? Yeah, I'll start with you. There's always that old cliche about, you know, generals trying to fight the last fight or fight the last fight better. I think at least with the chiefs as we've talked, we're all trying to win the next fight. Hmm. And we, I think we understand that the next fight is gonna be different. Uh, we have different technologies, we're gonna have different organizations. And quite frankly, we're, we're developing different doctrine uh, so we can fight and win the next fight. And, and we, we know we get it right when it's peace through strength and that strength comes from you know a strong whole government uh, approach with a strong military, but also strong allies and partners and as, as we go through this process where we have to take a look at our adversaries are going to use anything at their means uh to gain a, a decisive advantage and so as we go through our you know um 
uh, our war gaming and simulation. You know, we've seen what a pandemic can do uh, to us. So we should not assume that those who wish us harm would not be w- you know, willing to use those types of things. We've seen different types of explosives. Uh, we're certainly concerned about the proliferation of unmanned aerial systems, which have, you know, which I think are almost like the the IED or a few years back. A lot of people are using those type of things. And so I, I just think that we, we, we need to work together, make sure that we have a strong whole of government effect. We have a, a strong military and and, and and or so strong that that we that no one wants to take us on. General Brown. Yeah, I think, you know, if I had to maybe call it a blind spot, but one uh, kind of aha moment for me is the uh, the fact that I, I don't know that we're, we're moving fast enough and understand the pace of where our adversaries are going. And, and that's why when I came into this position, I, I wrote my strategic approach of Accelerate Change or Lose. Because the things we're doing today, I don't think will be successful tomorrow. Hmm. Which is going to drive us to actually look at how we would do things differently as a, uh, not only as an Air Force, but as a joint a team here in the department. And, uh, it really is going to have to uh, help to break down some of maybe some of the barriers and approaches we've taken to accelerate some of the capabilities we're going to need into the future. I, I think the other part I would also add to this is just the, um, we talked about uh, being able to connect. Um, it's really connecting the right sensor to the right shooter or right decision maker and, and being able to, to move forward and, and really be able to make decisions when you have imperfect information. Because I think the fog and friction we will see in the future will be at a higher level because we're so used to getting so much information now. You can either have information overload or information that is um, um, not necessarily uh, clear, or it could be deceptive, or we could be disconnected. And so those are going to be the challenges I see for us as we, as we go forward in the, in the future to be able to, to make those connections as quickly as possible and, and make decisions and being will, will, willing to take a little bit of risk. What we uh, probably we haven't done in the past 20, 30 years that we've done uh, you know, our, our fight against violent extremism, uh, particularly if you start getting into a high-end conflict. Uh, and that will be a challenge for us, not only as a as a service, but I would say as a nation as well. Well, listen, General Charles Q. Brown, Jr., Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General James McConville, Chief of Staff of the Army. This is really, really cool. I would just, you know, say, you know, one of the things I was thinking listening to you, because I was privileged to be able to do these conversations, you know, decades ago. If you took those conversations that were similar about strategy and capabilities 25 years ago and fast forward to today, I'm kind of very proud of how we've evolved and thought about it. So it gives me hope for the time we discuss all this 25 years from now. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, both of you, for sharing your thoughts on, on interoperability, about the future of defense, and about what you're both doing to work together, which I celebrate. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. It was great being with you. We appreciate it.